Who made the sun? Who made the moon? Who made the aardvark and the boo? Who made the species human and then dropped us here on Earth? Who made the whales and polar bears? Who knows our names and numbers? Who hairs? never sleeps and always cares and tells us what we're worth? Do you know what's in the Bible? Is it true? Is it reliable? Absolutely verifiable. Let's all take a look. In the Bible. Did he say Bible? Do you know what's in the Bible? Is it true? Is it reliable? Absolutely verifiable. Let's all take a look. In the Bible. With Buck Denver. So the Bible is a book. It's got pages and words just like other books. But if you open it up, you realize it's actually lots of books. 66 to be exact. There are books of history, books of poetry, books that are really letters written to different people or churches. Are there any books about ponies? Um, no. But there's even a book that talks about the end of the world. But we'll save that one until the end. It's a little tricky. Wow. So the Bible is sort of like other books and sort of isn't. That's right. Most books are written by just one person. The Bible was written by more than 40. Most books are written in, oh, six months or a year. We think the Bible may have been written over as much as 1,600 years. 1,600 years! That's like writing a book from the end of the Roman Empire until today. Done. That's incredible! And now, uh, through the magic of a popsicle stick of puppetry, uh, we bring you the story of everything. Everything? Pretty much. God, the man, the world. It's a genesis, man. It's the beginning of everything. Okay, let's hear it. A long time ago, right about uh, here, uh, there was God. God is a cloud? It makes about as much sense as showing him as an old man with whiskers. I see your point. The Bible says God is love, but when we tried to show him as a heart, he just looked like a valentine. Mm, too hallmark. Right. He appeared to the Israelites as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The fire thing was a little scary. So we decided to go with the cloud. I think we made the right choice. I couldn't agree more. In the beginning, there was nothing but God. No planets, no stars, no trees, no iguanas, no toaster ovens, no kids, no eyeglasses. Chester! Nothing, just God. And then he created, he spoke, and the universe came into being. The earth was formed and cooled and water appeared. Then God caused the plants and the fish and animals to pop up. And then he said, watch what I'm going to do next. This is going to be great. And boom, he made the man and the woman. They didn't have any clothes, so they had to stand behind the bushes whenever anyone took their picture. What? You know, for kids' Bibles and stuff. So God put Adam and Eve in a wonderful garden with everything they could want, and he gave them this uh, free will. That's right. But to really have free will, they needed to have a choice to make. So he put a tree in the garden and said that if they loved him and trusted him, they shouldn't eat from that tree. God gave Adam and Eve a choice. Trust him or trust the voices they heard around him. They chose poorly. By turning away from God, they said they didn't believe him. They were gonna go their own way. And sin entered the world. What sin? Sin is when we ignore God, when we go our own way, when we put ourselves first in front of our friends and neighbors and in front of God. When we say to God, I don't care what you say, I'm gonna do it my way. Sin entering the world changed everything. Why? Because of who God is. God is so pure, sin cannot be near him. Now that serpent knew that. He was trying to hurt God, and he knew if he could get Adam and Eve to sin, then they couldn't be close to God. God's most beloved creatures would have to live their lives apart from him. Couldn't God just change the rules so they could be with him again? He can do anything, right? Yes, God can do anything. Anything except change his own nature. He can't change who he is. If God changed who he was, he wouldn't be God anymore. So even though it made God very, very sad, Adam and Eve had to leave the garden and live new lives in a wild, mean world. Now they're a long, long way from paradise. Yes, they're a long, long way from home. And now the world they're in ain't very nice. If 
because they're living on their own. So once again, we ask the question, who do you trust? Who do you listen to? How are you going to live your life? This is choice. We've got to wrestle through every girl and boy and man and wife. This isn't a very happy story. Nope. And unfortunately, the rest of primeval history only gets worse. Sin has a way of spreading. So much so that one of Adam and Eve's sons turned on his brother and killed him. Oh, no. Then there were more and more people and more and more sin until God's creation was drowning in sin. God decided the only way to keep his creation from drowning in sin was to drown the sin. So he flooded the whole world. Oh, I know this story. Yep, all that sin was washed away. Unfortunately, so was most of his creation. But he chose one family led by one man to start over. Noah. That's right. Noah had tried to avoid sin all his life so he could be closer to God. He wasn't perfect, but he was a good man who listened for God's voice. That's why God chose him to start things over. Even a bunch of animals, of course. Who came in by twosies? Except for the ones they used for food. They came in by sevenies. You see, Noah trusted God and listened to God, and God used his family to start over again to give his creation a second chance. So patriarchal history is the story of God working through a series of fathers to save the world. Let's take a look. It's about 2000 BC, or 2000 years before Jesus was born, and we're in the city of Ur, possibly the biggest city in the world at that time, which was in what is now southern Iraq. Have you heard of Iraq? Yes, it's been in the news. Anyway, that's where Abram lived. Abram? Who's he? He's our first patriarch. There he was, minding his own business when God launched his rescue plan by tapping Abram on the shoulder. Abram heard a voice say, leave your father's house and go to the land I will show you. Abram figured this voice was God and thought he better listen to him. So he and his wife Sarah left Ur and wandered off following God's voice. And so God's plan began. That's how it starts. Two people wandering away from town. Yep, an act of faith. That's always how God's plans start. Someone hears God's voice, they believe, and they follow. And God uses them to do amazing things. Hallelujah, look what God can do. Hallelujah, his promises come true. If God is who he says he is, then we can trust his promises, so hallelujah, look what God can do. By faith, Abraham left his home in Ur. What's faith? Faith is believing that God is who he says he is, and that he'll do what he says he'll do. God said Abraham would have a son even though his wife couldn't have kids, and he was crazy old. And Abraham believed God. He had faith, and God gave him a son. Now, our faith grows the most when it's tested. So God asked Abraham if he would give up his son. Give up his son? Why would God want him to do that? God didn't want Abraham to give up Isaac. He wanted him to be willing to give up Isaac. God wanted to know if Abraham trusted him more than anything. Wanted to know if he would let go of everything before he let go of God. So what happened? Did Isaac have to die? I don't like this story. Hold on. At the last minute, as Abraham was ready to sacrifice Isaac to give him up to God, God sent an angel to stop him. And then he provided a ram for the sacrifice to take Isaac's place. Now God knew that Abraham trusted him completely. And Abraham and Isaac's faith grew because they knew God would keep his promises always. And they cried out, Hallelujah, look what God can do. Hallelujah, His promises come true. The evidence in miracles says God can work a miracle, so hallelujah, look what God can do. Now Isaac lived by faith, just as his father had before him. He got married and had a son named Jacob. Jacob trusted God too, and God gave him a whole mess of sons. His favorite was Joseph. Oh, I know about Joseph. He's the one with a fancy coat. Right. His brothers didn't like it, though. They thought it was too flashy. Well, actually, his brothers were jealous that their father loved Joseph the most. So they decided to get rid of Joseph once and for all by selling him. What? 
they sold their brother who heard of such a thing. Actually, I tried to sell you once when you were little. What? It was just in the neighbors. I got your back. You sold me? You were bagging me. Let's not tell mum about it, all right? You sold me? Ahem. Anywho, Joseph ended up in jail in Egypt, even though he hadn't done anything wrong. But God remembered his promises to Abraham, and he used Joseph to save Egypt from a famine. That means no food. And he became the right-hand man to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Joseph was the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. That's amazing. God even used him to save his brothers and the rest of his family from the famine and bring them to live with him in Egypt. And his brothers were so amazed, all they could say was, Hallelujah, look what God can do. Hallelujah, this promise has come true. Things are bad, we have no food, but Joseph is a righteous dude. Hallelujah, look what God can do. And that's the end of patriarchal history and the end of the book of Genesis. Abraham and his kids trusted God. They lived by faith and God used them to change the world. It seems like that rescue plan is a little bit stuck. Yes, for almost 400 years, the children of Israel, that's what we call them because Israel was the new name God gave Jacob, the children of Israel seemed stuck in Egypt. Abraham's descendants were certainly multiplying, but they weren't getting their own land, and they were slaves. But God was about to get his rescue plan back in gear, as it's time to meet one of the most important people in the Bible and in all of history, a guy named Moses. Have you heard of him? This is a story about a boy his name was moses and it brought his mom such joy she had to hide him it makes me shiver to keep old pharaoh's men from throwing him in the river a hebrew baby was born and hidden in a reed basket at the edge of the nile river and who should find him but pharaoh's own daughter who adopted him and named him moses he was raised in the royal palace but still knew he was a hebrew a child of israel and one day when he saw an egyptian beating another hebrew he got so mad he sort of overreacted did he call him a name um no he uh he killed him he what um Yep, he killed the Egyptian. Well, that couldn't have gone over very well. No, it didn't. When Pharaoh found out, he said Moses had to die, and so Moses did what most sensible people would do. What's that? He took off running! And now he's running, running, running for his life Out to the desert where he finds himself a wife Her name's Zipporah. And now he's hiding out with his sheep Cause he knows back in Egypt he's in trouble deep now, you probably know this story. So Moses is in the desert when God shows up in a bush. Wait, God is in a bush? Well, he's speaking through a bush. Not an ordinary bush, though. It's burning. That makes it more dramatic. Right. I can see why that would make it more dramatic. Right. More dramatic than a regular bush. But what if the bush was a dancing bush or a juggling bush? That'd be dramatic, wouldn't it? Let's stay focused. Sorry. Ahem. So God tells Moses to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And Moses says, I don't want to. And God says, I want you to. And Moses says, I can't. And God says, you can. And Moses says, will you come with me? And God says, of course I will. And so Moses goes back to Egypt to face down Pharaoh. This is a story about a man who faced a stubborn king that didn't understand that when you park your stubborn self right in God's way, let's just assume you're gonna have a lousy day. Oh, there were gnats and frogs and the river turned to blood and there were flies and boils and the cows fell with the thud and then the locusts came and ate up all the crops and there was hail and darkness but it wouldn't stop saying no. That's right, Pharaoh still wouldn't let them go, so God had to do something very serious. The final plague was the death of Egypt's firstborn sons. It was terribly sad, but it finally convinced Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go. 
To protect their own sons from the final plague, God told the Israelites to sacrifice a spotless lamb, a lamb without flaw, and put the blood on the doorposts of their homes. The angel that brought death to the Egyptian sons saw the blood on the doorposts and passed over the Israelite homes. Jewish people celebrate this miraculous part of God's rescue plan each year with a festival called Passover. Wait a minute. What was so special about that lamb that it could save the life of a boy? There was nothing special about the lamb. It was just a regular lamb. But God used a spotless lamb as a lesson about sin and a sign of something that would happen much later in his rescue plan. So what was the lesson? He was reminding them that the price of sin is death. Death was coming to the Egyptians that night because of their sin. But the Israelites weren't perfect either. In 400 years in Egypt, most of them had forgotten all about God. They were doing whatever they wanted to do. So the lamb at Passover was a reminder that sin takes our life away. Rather than losing their sons, God let them use lambs as a sacrifice for their own sin to take the place of their sons. That sort of reminds me of Abraham and Isaac. What do you mean? Well, God provided that ram to take the place of Isaac. Isaac didn't have to die. Instead, the ram took his place on the altar. Oh, it's connected. Yep, God does that a lot. The ram instead of Isaac and the lamb instead of the sons of Israel are both signs God used to point ahead to his ultimate rescue plan, his ultimate plan for saving us from the power and the price of sin. Ooh, tell me that part. I can't. It's in the New Testament, and we're not there yet. Rats. The Egyptians learned the hard way that sinning against God can lead to death. And now the Israelites were learning that this was true for them, too. Trying to live so close to a holy God was very, very hard. So did they give up? Some of them wanted to. Some even wanted to go back to Egypt and be slaves again. But by the end of the 40-year timeout and Moses' big pep talk, the children of Israel were excited to be God's holy nation again and were ready to follow their new leader, Joshua, into the Promised Land. And that brings us to the end of the first big section of the Bible, the Pentateuch. And Adam and Eve and Joseph and Sometimes called five books of Moses He's the one whose life composes The storyline of all these books With the exception of Genesis Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers Read a little every day before you slumber Cap it all off with a trip through Deuteronomy Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy Parts are fun, others not so much With sinning and flooding and plagues and such Whether you're German or French or Dutch We can all learn a thing from the pen of touch That's not right Whether you're a king or a queen or a duke We, we can, can all learn a thing from the pen of touch Genesis is the introduction Tell us why the world has ceased to function Quite the way God intended it from the start From the start, from the very beginning Sin came in and made a mess of all the God was gonna bless us Because we did not trust him with all our hearts And now we've fallen The world is fallen Oh yes, we've fallen Away from God It's a tragedy, nasty tragedy And now we're broken Our hearts are broken And our world is seriously flawed It's all messed up But God's gonna launch his rescue plan That starts with Sarah and To Pharaoh, out of luck. So God told Moses he'd help out, and that's what he did. You bet your baby. We see in Exodus they have success because Moses respects our God and his decree. That's a fancy word for law. And now it's I, and I, the laws get piled up high. Get us to Pharaoh, and they agree. Leviticus is a bunch of rules. Numbers, he is real, I'll act like fools. Forty years later, Moses schooled them again. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. We'll try harder, the young one said. 
Moses gets older, now he's dead He followed Joshua instead All the way to the promised land We like the Bible, it's not a fluke That it all starts out with the Pentateuch Five little books that tell the story of God And Eve and Adam and Joseph and Whether you're a king or a queen or a duke We can all learn a thing from the Pentateuch Before we get to Matthew, Mark and Luke We really need to understand the Pentateuch the historical books are the next 12 books. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. What's next, Sunday School reading? That brings us to the 8th book of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Ruth is a tiny little book that's easy to read. It tells just one story, the story of a woman named Gladys. I'm kidding, her name is Ruth. Once upon a time, there was a woman named Ruth. She wasn't an Israelite, she was from Moab, a country Israel didn't like very much. But Ruth, she married an Israelite. As our story begins, Ruth, her Israelite husband, and her husband's mother were all living in the Moab because there was a famine in Israel. So there they are in the Moab when, oh no, Ruth's husband dies! I don't know what happened. Maybe he got hit by a bus. I don't think they had buses back then. Okay, maybe he got hit by a cow. Jester. A goat? Jester. An ill-tempered iguana? Jester. Now, Ruth's mother-in-law, her name is Naomi, she doesn't have a husband either. He died a while back, probably another iguana. Jester! Or something. Naomi doesn't really belong in the Moab, she's an Israelite. So as soon as the famine ends, she decides to go back to Israel. Of course, she is old and has no husband and no money, so she'll have to beg for food. Her life will be sad. Well, guess what? Ruth doesn't want that to happen. She loves Naomi. So even though Moab is her home, Ruth says to Naomi, I will come with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? I'm telling you, that part makes me cry every time. Yeah, that's really something. Uh, anyway, this amazing Ruth, she leaves her home and goes to Israel with Naomi to take care of her. Every day she follows the workers in the fields to pick up little bits of grain to, to share with Naomi. Oh, I'm losing it, but... But get this, this is the best part. So she's picking up bits of grain in a field that belongs to a wealthy man named Boaz, who happens to be related to Naomi's old husband, the one that died in the iguana accident. I don't think he was killed by an iguana. Whatever. Anyway, Boaz sees Ruth into the field and hears about what she's done for Naomi. He hears about her great love for her mother-in-law. And get this, he falls in love love with Ruth. Wonderful Ruth. And, and Ruth and Boaz end up getting married. And Boaz takes care of Ruth and takes care of Naomi, her mother-in-law. And everyone is happy. Oh, gather round kids and hear me sing. All about Israel's godly king. See what good this guy can bring in the books of First and Second Samuel. Israel is a nasty mess. Just read judges and get depressed. A king could help them pass the test in the books of First and Second Samuel. That's the books of First and Second Samuel. Hey! Samuel was a prophet. And a very important prophet, because God used him to find and help Israel's king. So God sent Samuel out one more time to pick a king, a godly king who would follow God's heart rather than his own. And this time, God had him pick... David! Right? Am I right, or is it someone else? David. David was a son of a man named Jesse, who was a son of Obed, who was a son of Ruth and Boaz. David was a godly young man from a godly family. 
Samuel anointed David with oil. That was a sign that God was choosing him. As soon as Samuel anointed David, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Tell him about the promise. What promise? You mean the one about the land and the nation and the blessing for the world? The one God gave Abraham? Oh no, it's a new promise for David. That's right, Brother Louie. God is so pleased with David that in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, he makes David an amazing promise. God tells David that someone from his family, one of his descendants, will rule over God's people forever. Whoa, that's a big promise. It sure is. This promise is called the Davidic Covenant. Davidic? What kind of word is Davidic? The word Davidic means about David, or having to do with David. Oh, so if something was about Ian, it would be Ianic. Well... And if it was about Clive, it would be Cloivic. <laughs> Cloivic, that's funny. Hilarious. This promise for David, or Davidic covenant, is so important that in the New Testament, when Matthew talks about God's rescue plan, he puts King David right in the middle. So God's ultimate rescue plan, the blessing for the whole world, is going to come from David's family. Hey, shouldn't we sum up everything we learned with a song? That's a great idea. Let's sing it in the river, in our canoes. If you open the Old Testament and read it categorically, you'll find a dozen books that we are meant to read historically. They tell the tales of Israel, there's nothing metaphorical, and that is why these books are in the section called historical. Oh, hello, Clive and Ian. Hi there. Hello. Oh, Joshua and Judges and Ruth and both the Samuels. First and second kings in front of first and second chronicles. Ezra, Nehemiah, and now there's just one more to fall. Esther is the final of the books we call historical. And what do we learn from these books? Anyone? The dad will keep his promises always and forevermore. And he is always with us, no matter what may be in store. But from these books, the lesson learned that peace with God cannot be earned from Joshua to Nehemiah. What they need is a Messiah. So we're wrapping up our journey through the books we call historical. We'll ask another question, and no, it's not rhetorical. Do you think that you are good enough all on your own to get to God? Or have you learned from Israel that humankind is badly flawed? They tried a thousand years, but couldn't right their wrong behavior. And that is why for you and I the answer is a savior. Yes, yes that is why for you and I the answer is a savior. That's just what we need. <laughs> and maybe a paddle. The Old Testament is filled with poetry. Nearly every book has at least a little poetry, but right in the middle, we hit five books that are almost all poetry. We call these books the writings. Job is an interesting book about a guy who loses everything and has to take a look to see if he only trusted God because his life was grand could he still be trusting if all he had was sand and sores all over his body yes that too Psalms is 150 songs you could try to sing them all but it would take too long They'd write a psalm when they were glad or when they'd been invaded And nearly half of all the psalms were written by King David He must have been very busy Indeed And then along comes Proverbs A book that's full of Proverbs Short little sayings that make us wise And teach us how to live our lives What's cool is that a lot of them 
were written by King Solomon. That almost rhyme. It was close. What's next? Ecclesiastes, 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 Ecclesiastes. If life seems meaningless and hard to understand, listen to the preacher and he'll give you an Cause there's no need for questioning your sanity. No vanity of vanity, everything is vanity. When you're thinking, you're thinking in the sand. Trust God and follow his commands. Now one more book in the writings. Though I don't find it particularly exciting. Song of Solomon. Mushy, mushy, mushy. Celebrating love between a man and a woman Engaged to be married Saying silly things like My dear, you've got goats in your hair He doesn't seem very wise Perhaps you'll like it when you're older No, I don't think so And those are the writings Job and Psalms and Proverbs Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon Hairy sheep teeth The end The next section of the Old Testament is called the Prophets and some of the books are very, very short. Pastor Paul, what is a prophet? Several Hebrew words are translated as prophet in English. The most common means one who is called. Most importantly, a prophet is someone who speaks for someone else. In the Old Testament, that someone else is usually God. So in the Old Testament, a prophet is someone who is called by God to speak for him. The major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And the minor prophets are all the others, except Lamentations, which tags along with Jeremiah in the major prophets. So the prophets did what exactly? Prophets were kind of like alarm clocks. Beg pardon? An alarm clock is a wake-up call. If you're about to miss something important because you're asleep, like school or church or your wedding, an alarm clock goes off and wakes you up. It yells, hey, stop sleeping or there's gonna be trouble. Most people I know don't particularly like alarm clocks. I don't like my alarm clock at all. Sometimes people really don't wanna be woken up. And the same was true of prophets. When Israel wasn't following the covenant, when they'd sort of fallen asleep in their relationship with God, God would send a prophet like an alarm clock to sound an alarm, to say, hey, wake up or there's gonna be trouble. And just like with alarm clocks, it didn't always go so well. The first book of the prophets is a book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a really long book with 66 chapters. The book of Isaiah is so long, partly because Isaiah's ministry as a prophet was so long. The name Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation. So what's important about Isaiah? What do we need to remember? That God is holy and will judge sin, but also that God is the one who can save us. Yahweh is our salvation. King Hezekiah got it right. King Ahaz didn't. That's right. Most importantly, Isaiah tells us that God can save all of us through the Messiah. Isaiah announces a Messiah who's for everyone, not just Israel. What else does he say? Isaiah says this Messiah will be punished for our sins. All the punishment we deserve will be put on this Messiah instead of on us. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. Isaiah is saying, look ahead, look forward. It's all about the Messiah. What a great message. What a great book. But we gotta keep moving. We need to sing a song to summarize all of them. 
Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then Lamentations. Ezekiel, Daniel, without hesitation comes Hosea, Joel, and Amos, then Obadiah, Jonah, Mike, and Nam, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, then just three more tiny little guys, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. These are the prophets, they're eight man fire. They're in two sections called the major and the minor. They bring God's messages, each called an oracle. Divvy them up into buckets, categorical. Indictment, judgment, instruction, aftermath, bright, bright future if you're walking on a godly path. Being God's prophet could wear you out quick. From sleeping with the lions to staring at a brick. Reading about the prophets, prophesying to the government. Teaches us important stuff about the new covenant. And how the Messiah's gonna pay for our crime. Let's go through the list one more time. Isaiah, These Jeremiah, the and then Lamentations. Ezekiel, Daniel, 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 without Daniel, hesitation, comes Hosea, Joel, and Amos, then Obadiah. Jonah, Mike, and Nahum, come back to Zephaniah. Then just three more tiny little guys, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They're in two sections called the major and the minor. And that's a quick overview of the Old Testament. God promised Abraham that he would make him a nation and that if they followed God's rules, his laws for how they should live, that God would bless them and live with them. Of course, they couldn't follow God's rules perfectly. They kept messing up over and over again. So Isaiah and the other prophets hint that a new solution is coming, a new covenant. And that brings us to the New Testament. Are you ready? This is where it gets good. So where do we start? Revelation? Uh, no, that's the end of the New Testament. The epistles? No, we need to start at the beginning. The gospels. Alrighty, the gospels. Um, what is a gospel? Good question. You've probably heard the word gospel before. But what does it mean? Uh, Pastor Paul? The word gospel comes from the old English word Godspell, which means God's good story. This old English word came from the Greek word euangelion, meaning good news. So gospel means good news. And don't tell me this good news. It's the news about God's blessing for the world, the one we've been waiting for, the Messiah. But. In church, I learned that the New Testament is about Jesus. So what does Jesus have to do with the blessing for the whole world, the promise God made to Abraham? Good question, Ian. If you've spent much time in church, you probably know that the Gospels tell the story of Jesus. But how could the life of one man be God's blessing for the entire world? What did he do, and what does it matter to us? What is the good news? Then without further delay, the story of Jesus. I'm sure you all have heard the story of Jesus being born. Every Christmas, a manger, an inn, the star, the wise men. Right. The story of Jesus' birth is told in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Mark and John skip that part and start when Jesus has already grown up. But even Matthew and Luke don't start with the birth of Jesus. Luke starts with the birth of a guy named John. And Matthew starts with Jesus' genealogy. Do you know what a genealogy is? A genealogy is a record of a person's ancestry. Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and so on and so on. Matthew traces Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Abraham. And right there in the middle, halfway between Abraham and Jesus, is King David. So Jesus is related to King David. So what? Wait, the Davidic Covenant. <gasps> oh, right, the promise God made to David that one of his descendants would rule God's people forever. Exactly. Matthew starts with Jesus' genealogy so that everyone who knows the Old Testament would say, hey, Jesus is a descendant of King David. You know what that might mean. It meant God's promise to David could be coming true in Jesus. Exactly. Right from the start, Matthew connects the New Testament to the Old Testament and says the promises God made to Abraham and Moses and the Israelites are coming true today. Well, what happened between him being born and being all grown up? We don't really know. 
Luke tells one story about Jesus when he was 12, but Mark and John don't even start until Jesus is already 30. For them, this is when the story of Jesus begins, and it begins with John the Baptist announcing that everything God has promised is about to come true. So Jesus shows up and asks John to baptize him too. And as Jesus comes up out of the water, the sky opens and the Spirit of God comes down on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven says, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Whoa, so that voice was God talking. Which means Jesus is God's son, the son of God. And the spirit that came down is the spirit of God. Wait, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? That's the Trinity, we learned about this. We sure did. God is one God with three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three are God, and yet God is one. I remember this part. It made my head hurt then, and it still makes my head hurt. The important thing is that now all three persons of God show up at one time in one place. Whoa, the people watching must have known something big was going on. Something very big was going on. So, what happened next? After his baptism and temptation in the wilderness, Mark tells us that Jesus went back to Galilee, the place he grew up, saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Gospel, that means good news. Now Jesus picks 12 men to be his disciples. Uh, Pastor Paul, what is a disciple? A disciple is a follower of a teacher. At the time of Jesus, many rabbis, teachers of God's law, had disciples who followed them everywhere, learning everything they taught. John the Baptist had disciples of his own, some of whom started following Jesus. So Jesus picks 12 men to be his disciples. These guys are really important, and some, like Peter and John, end up writing books that are now in the New Testament. Jesus is teaching in Galilee, and people are amazed at what they hear. Why were they amazed? Was he really good at math? No, it wasn't that kind of teaching. Jesus was explaining the Old Testament scriptures, what the prophets meant when they said certain things. There were lots of teachers back then, but Jesus taught with authority, explaining things in ways no one had ever heard before, explaining things like he was God. But then Jesus started doing something even more amazing. He started healing people, people who were sick or blind, people who couldn't walk or who couldn't use one of their hands. Jesus just touched them or even just said a word and they were healed, completely healed. That must have gotten people's attention. It sure did. Suddenly Jesus was surrounded by huge crowds. Everyone wanted to be close to him. Jesus' teaching and miracles were attracting a lot of attention, including the Pharisees, who wanted to know who this new guy was and if he was following all their rules. So while the Pharisees and Sadducees try to figure out what to do, Jesus keeps traveling and teaching and healing people. He tells little stories called parables that teach about the kingdom of God. He explains how we should live in this kingdom. He calms a storm on the Sea of Galilee, showing he has authority over nature. He feeds 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, showing he has authority to create abundance out of little. And he even brings a girl back from the dead, showing he has authority even over death. Now Passover was coming around again, so they all headed to Jerusalem. So Jesus and his disciples gather for the Passover meal, just like all the Jews did every year. But Jesus does something very different that no one expects. First, he says one of his 12 disciples is going to betray him, help the Sadducees and Pharisees grab him and take him away. This freaks everybody out. Then Jesus picks up a piece of the bread they were eating and says, this is my body, which is given for you. Then he picks up the cup they were drinking from and says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Wait, what's going on? Was Jesus saying that, that he was the Passover lamb? He was the one who would die so that we could live? 
that's exactly what he was saying. Jesus took the Passover meal, where Israelites celebrated being saved from death and from slavery by the blood of a lamb, and said he was that lamb, that his blood could take away sin and death from everyone, the blessing for the whole world, the new covenant God was making with his children. <gasps> new covenant? That's what New Testament means. <gasps> This is what the whole New Testament is about. The blood of Jesus is the new covenant. The whole Bible points to this moment, from Genesis when we learn how creation was broken by sin, to Abraham, Moses, and David, to the prophets who say the answer is coming, the Savior is coming, the Messiah is coming. The entire Bible is about this. But the story isn't over yet. Jesus goes to a garden to pray. He knows what he has to do now, and it isn't going to be easy. After he prays, he turns to his friends and says, the hour has come. And right then, his disciple Judas shows up, leading a crowd of guards to arrest Jesus. They put Jesus on trial, first at the Jewish court called the Sanhedrin, run by the Sadducees and Pharisees. His crime, blasphemy saying he was equal to God. His punishment? Death. But the Romans don't let the Sanhedrin put anyone to death themselves, so the members of the court drag Jesus to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And even though Pilate doesn't think Jesus has done anything wrong, he doesn't want the Sadducees and Pharisees to complain about him to Rome like they've done with other governors before him. So he gives in. He washes his hands in front of everyone, a way of saying, this isn't my fault. And he has Jesus killed, crucified, by nailing him to a wooden cross. The people around Jesus just saw a man dying on a cross, but that's not what God saw. God saw something very different happening. God saw his son, the son of God, on a cross. Then he saw the stain of our sin appearing on Jesus. Your sin, my sin, everything selfish and mean we've ever done or ever could do. The stain of all that sin was appearing on Jesus, even though he'd never done anything wrong at all. God saw his son stained with all the sin of the world. He saw him buried under all that sin. He saw him die under all that sin. And since the punishment for all that sin is death, death away from God, that's how Jesus died, alone, away from God. The last thing Jesus said was, God, God, why have you left me alone? That makes my heart break. It makes me wanna cry. So, Jesus took the punishment for my sin. He took the punishment that I deserved. He died alone so I wouldn't have to. I gotta think about that for a minute. But if he died, how can we say Jesus has power over death? Because he didn't stay dead. Jesus was crucified on a Friday and placed in a tomb that night. On Sunday morning, two women who were followers of Jesus went to the tomb and discovered something incredible. It was empty. The huge stone that blocked the entrance had been rolled away and Jesus wasn't there. Matthew and Luke both tell us that the women meet an angel who says Jesus is no longer dead. He's alive. This is what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. This is what we celebrate every Sunday, but especially on Easter Sunday. They didn't have to take the angel's word for it though, because Jesus appears right in front of them, living, walking around and talking. And then Jesus appears to his disciples, and then to more than 500 people. Jesus proved that he had authority over death itself, that the power of sin and death was broken, that the kingdom of God was real, and that we can all be a part of it.
Wow, that's not just good news, that's amazing news. So, is this it? Is that how it ends? Jesus tells his disciples to go tell everyone. Spread the blessing to the whole world so everyone can hear. So everyone has a chance to be a part of the new kingdom. And then, according to Luke, Jesus blesses his disciples and disappears into the clouds. Around 30 years after Jesus left his followers on earth, Luke sat down to write the history of everything that had happened from Jesus' birth up till that very day. He wrote his history in two parts. The first part told the story of Jesus, and the second part told what happened in the 30 years after Jesus left. His followers were called apostles, a word that means sent ones. Jesus sent them into the world to spread his message. Right. That's why the full name of Luke's second book is the Acts of the Apostles, but we call it Acts for short. Luke starts the book of Acts with the same scene that ended his gospel, Jesus saying goodbye to his disciples. But he tells them something interesting. He says they should stay in Jerusalem and wait for a gift that God the Father is going to give them, a gift that will help them spread the good news about Jesus throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It was 10 days after Jesus left them, 50 days after Passover, on a day called Pentecost. So all of Jesus' followers were together, kind of hiding away to try to keep out of trouble. And suddenly, a sound like a huge wind filled the house. And then something that looked like little tongues of fire came down on each one of them. Did they catch on fire? Did they stop, drop, and roll? Luke says it was like fire, not that it was fire. So no, they didn't catch on fire. Writing some parts of the Bible was tricky because the authors were trying to describe things that no one had ever seen before. So when Mark says the Spirit came down on Jesus like a dove, or when Luke says the Spirit came down on Jesus' followers like tongues of fire, it wasn't a real dove and their heads weren't really on fire. That's just the best way the authors could come up with to describe what people saw. So what powers did they get? Did anyone start shooting web? No, no web shooting. The first thing that happened was they all started speaking in different languages. The Holy Spirit gave Peter the power to get up and speak an amazing message about who Jesus was. Peter proclaimed the good news, and about 3,000 people who heard Peter speak became followers of Jesus that day. That power really helped them a lot. The apostles were preaching in the temple almost every day, so the Sadducees had them all arrested and thrown in jail. But that night, an angel came and let them out and then told them to go right back to preaching in the temple. So sure enough, the next morning when the Sadducees walked in, there were all the apostles out of jail and preaching in the temple. <laughs> I'd love to see the looks on their faces. They were amazed and furious. And so they had the temple guards beat the apostles with whips as a punishment and then let them go. The apostles who were beaten actually thanked God that they got to suffer for the name of Jesus. These are the same people who, when Jesus was arrested, ran away and hid. When Jesus was on trial, Peter told people three different times that he didn't even know Jesus. And now he's fearless. He's talking about Jesus no matter what happens. He's like a whole different person. That's what the Holy Spirit can do. Whoa. I sure wish I could be that brave. You can. This is the best news of all. You see, the same Holy Spirit that filled Peter and the apostles will fill us if we're following Jesus. Whoa, how do I get it? How does it work? Tell me more. It's all a part of God's rescue plan that we'll be talking about through the rest of the New Testament. But first, we need to finish the book of Acts. God was going to pick someone very unusual to carry the good news all the way to Rome. Someone the early believers were so afraid of, they wouldn't even let him in their homes. Someone absolutely perfect for the job. This young man was a Pharisee, a very strict Pharisee, and he thought anyone who followed Jesus should be arrested, or worse. So how does someone who thinks Jesus was wrong end up being the guy who spreads the good news of Jesus farther than anyone else? That's a good story. Uh, Sunday school lady? 
As Paul was traveling to Damascus, a bright light from the sky hit him, and he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Paul fell to the ground and said, Who are you? And the voice said, I'm Jesus, the one you're trying to hurt. Meanwhile, in Damascus, there lived a man named Ananias, who was a follower of Jesus. He had a vision, like Peter on the roof, and Jesus shows up in his vision. Saul is the one I'm going to use to spread the good news about me to Jews and Gentiles and even to kings. So Ananias goes and finds Saul, and when he puts his hands on him, immediately Saul can see again. And Saul becomes a follower of Jesus and starts running around Damascus saying, Jesus is the Son of God. Wow, that's quite a change. He went from arresting people who believe in Jesus to telling people to believe in Jesus. Is that when they changed his name from Saul to Paul? No, his Jewish friends always called him Saul, and his Gentile friends always called him Paul. Luke starts calling him Paul in the book of Acts when he starts traveling among Gentiles. Paul started preaching and teaching in Damascus. He was so smart that no one could argue with him. The next 13 books in the New Testament are the Pauline epistles. Pauline? Who's she? I don't think it's a girl's name. Pauline is a girl's name, but that's not the way we're using it. The word Pauline means of Paul. And epistle? Epistle is a Greek word that means letter. So the Pauline epistles are the letters of Paul. Everywhere Paul went on his three big trips, people started following Jesus. All the Jesus followers in a city would meet together and form what we call a church, a word that means a group that assembles together. But Paul couldn't stay and keep teaching every one of these groups, so when they had questions about what Jesus taught or about how they should live as his followers, Paul would write them letters. Before they had the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the churches needed help to know just what to base their lives upon. So Paul wrote them a letter. He'd write them once, he'd write them twice. And make the problem better with helpful hints and good advice. what they need? They need it. Letters of Paul, the letters of Paul. Some are short and some are tall. Tall? You mean long. But that doesn't rhyme. Letters of Paul, the letters of Paul. Some are big and some are small. Oh, I guess that works. Many of the ones he sent are now in the New Testament. And one and all, from big to small, can read and love the letters of Paul. Well, that's fantastic, but what are these letters? What? You want us to name every one? Yes, every single one. All right. Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and then Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Next is Colossians and 2 Thessalonians. Someone should hang these up in the Smithsonian. Now after Timothy 1 and 2, there's only two left for reading through. Titus Philemon, our last of all. Titus Philemon, so very small. Titus Philemon, the last of all. And And those are the letters, the letters of Paul. Great. Those are the letters. Yep, those are the letters. So, what do they say? Back to Paul. We are justified, given a new label, by grace as a free gift through faith. Faith? She lives right over... It's not the girl faith, it's the idea. Well, why they name so many ideas after girls? Um, I think it's the other way around. To have faith in something is to believe it is what it says it is, and that it will do what it says it will do. That's right. To have faith in God is to believe that he is who he says he is, and that he will do what he says he will do. But you can have faith in anything. I have faith in a chair every time I sit in one because I'm believing that it will hold me up. And I have faith in an airplane every time I get in one because I believe it will take me up into the air and then bring me back down again safely wherever I want. So what do we have faith in, believe in, to get this free gift of righteousness? God? Kind of. Jesus? Closer. Jesus in a chair? Or an airplane? 
Nope. In one of his letters, Paul says he will not boast in anything. In other words, he won't say, I got this label of righteousness because I worked so hard, or because I'm such a good person, or because I go to church every Sunday. Nope. He says the only thing he can boast in is the cross of Jesus Christ. The power to justify us, to change our labels from sinful to righteous, is in what Jesus did on the cross. You see, because Jesus is God, he has God's righteousness, perfect righteousness. Jesus is the only one who deserves to wear the righteous label, who could ever earn that merit badge. When he went to the cross, he took the stain of my sin. He took my label, sinful and then he beat death. He destroyed the power of sin, and he gave me his label, righteous. His label makes me a child of God, a son of the king, and I can wear it forever. So as you're watching and learning, if you realize that you've never decided to follow Jesus, that you've never said, hey, I want to be a part of the kingdom of God, but you think you want to, Talk to your parents or your Sunday school teacher or your pastor. If you're a grown-up, talk to another grown-up that you know follows Jesus. And keep watching because we've got a whole lot more to learn. It sure is good to be done with all the letters, right, Clive? I don't think we're done with all the letters. What do you mean? He's right, Ian. We're done with the letters written by Paul, but those aren't the only letters in the New Testament. Paul's epistles start with Romans and go to tiny little Philemon. Then we have a big letter called Hebrews, and then James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude. These seven letters after Hebrews are called the General Epistles. Because they were all written by generals in the army. Um, uh, no. Paul's letters were written to specific churches or specific people. They are specific letters. These seven letters aren't written to specific people, but to all Christians or all Jewish Christians in general. Hence the name General Epistles. So none of these letters were written to specific people or churches. Right. Um, except for 2 John, which may have been written to a specific church, and 3 John, which was written to a guy named Gaius. So why are they in the general epistles? All right then, moving on. Good day, world. It's time for the last book of the Bible, Revelation, a book that I'm hoping is easy to explain. Right, Phil? Well, maybe not the easiest book. According to this expert, Revelation is one of the most complicated books in the entire Bible. Oh, um, okay. Well, that's just one expert. And this expert says Revelation is one of the most difficult books in the entire Bible. Oh, dear. It's difficult. It's difficult. And very cryptic. It's what we call. It's what we call. Apocalyptic. Full of symbols, dreams, and visions. Waves us with some tough decisions. What's this? What's this? Symbol represent. What's the? What's the? Message being sent. Crazy scenes from our creator. You might need your calculator cause in here you'll find it true that numbers, that numbers can be symbols too revelation what a trip i read it as i sail my ship these messages to john were sent if only if only i knew what they meant Ay, ay, ay. This stuff is crazy. Studying Revelation is like studying a forest. Each sign, each symbol is like a tree. If we stare too closely at each tree, if we get lost in the details, we miss what the whole forest is trying to tell us. We have to back up. We have to get in our helicopter and fly way up high to look at the whole book and ask, what is God trying to tell us? Well, what did you guys hear? Mm, let's see. It's clear that God is going to destroy evil and set things right, but he's been waiting. 
Right, but he's only going to wait so long. There will be signs and warnings, and then he will step in and end evil. And the closer we get to that time, it seems, the more trouble there will be for the church, because we have an enemy. Satan who hates us and wants the whole world to work against us. But Satan has already lost, beaten by the Lamb. The Lamb of God, that's Jesus, who, just like the Passover Lamb in Exodus, gave his life to save our lives. He paid for our sin, so we can change from God's enemies to God's friends. So Revelation is a warning and an encouragement. It warns us that we have an enemy who is always trying to hurt us, working through the powers of the world. And things are going to get worse before they get better. But Revelation is also an encouragement because the final battle has already been won. Even though the church will suffer, our future is safe with God. We have nothing to be afraid of. So how does it end? If we don't end up on clouds playing harps, where do we end up? Oh, this is the best part. After evil is destroyed, John looks up and sees a new heaven and a new earth, restored, redeemed, cleaned of all evil. It's the kingdom of God in full bloom at last. And it's heaven and earth together. And this is how the story ends. It started with a garden and ends with a garden city, the city of God, where there is no death, no tears, no sickness, no bullies, a resurrected earth cleaned of sin and evil, where we will live, work, eat, play, sing, and dance with the God who made us and loves us very much. The world is a messy place. Spend more than a day or two here and you're going to get hurt by someone or something. But this book tells us where that hurt comes from. Sin, rebellion, us wanting to be the ones in charge. It also tells us how we can be saved from sin by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It tells us about the wonderful work we can do spreading his kingdom, helping others, seeing ourselves become more and more like Jesus. And it tells us the really amazing ending when God's kingdom bursts into full bloom. And that is what's in the Bible. So what are you gonna do now? What do you mean, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna follow Jesus. I'm gonna help grow the kingdom of God. What else is there? Well, what about you? I'd like to be in the kingdom of God Where there's no crying, there's no dying It makes me want to applaud and say hey God You're fantastic and I am so enthusiastic We'll redeem creation and I get to share your invitation With everybody, with everybody I meet And now I'd like to whistle With everybody, with everybody I meet. Don't miss more fun with me and my friends at jellytelly.com!